morning. It is a joy to welcome you on this glorious Easter Sunday as we gather together to celebrate and to proclaim the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we gather here today, we are privileged to witness the proclamation of faith of two young people who have made Jesus Christ their Savior and Lord. As they come and celebrate this very important moment in their lives, I encourage you to remember your own baptism, to remember the cleansing healing of these waters and of the grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. This is Hannah McCormick. She comes today having made her profession of faith in Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. Hannah, I ask you the most important question of your life. Who is Jesus? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you, my sister, Hannah McCormick, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is Chase McCormick, Hannah's little brother, by just one minute. And so with just one minute separating your natural birth between you and your sister, one minute separating your baptism as well, I ask you the most important question of your life, who is Jesus? My Savior. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I baptize you, my brother, Chase McCormick. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's children say, let us continue in our worship together. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for Chase and for Hannah. We thank you for the decision that they have made to follow you. We pray that as they continue to grow in their faith, that we will walk beside them, learning with them and learning from them, that as a family of faith, we will embrace them as they learn what it means to answer your call to discipleship. And on this Easter Sunday, we join our voices with those on that first morning who cried out, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And in that news, we sing, we dance, and we celebrate that the empty tomb means that our lives are filled with your love and your grace. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ. Darkness has been vanquished. The ring of light has come. Come, let us worship and celebrate the good news. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Amen. Amen. Let us join together now as we sing our hymn of praise, number 287, Lift High the Cross. Hymn number 287. Let us stand as we sing.
Our scripture reading is from Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And all that had been commanded them they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward Jesus himself sent out through them, from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. I'd like to invite the children to come down for the children's time. If you all will come join me. Wow, good crowd. Everybody doing okay this morning? Good, good. Anything exciting going on? Huh? It's Easter, yeah. It's a busy day for me. Um, if you don't mind, um, I, I haven't had a chance to look at the paper yet this morning. and Because uh, it's been a busy day for me. And uh, I just want to see if there's any news in here. There, there's a, a picture of a church. That's important. Um, Looks like they're... Having a worship service, that's good. Um, do your parents ever read the newspaper? No. No? no. Never read the newspaper? <laughs> I don't either, <laughs> I'll confess to you. Um, I watch the news and everything. But you know, there are a lot of people who read the newspaper. And Oh, there's, a, there's one right here, Duke 81, Michigan State 61. Does anybody know anything about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. The Blue Devils won last night. You know, I told someone, the devil may have won last night, but Jesus is getting up in the morning. <laughs> and here we are. That's right. Well, yay, Duke. We're hopeful they will do well. There are a lot of people who read the newspaper, probably some parents out there and grandparents who read the newspaper. With this, there are basically three or four things that people do when they look at the newspaper. First of all, they read the stories. There's a story here about a church I think they've gone through a hard time, and um, they are still having their worship services, even though they've been through a hard time. But they, there are other stories ha here about someone building a house and so on like that, and different things. People read the newspaper, and if they find an interesting story, they, they start thinking about that story. And they think about what that story means, especially if it's a story that has something to do with our community or with their life. And after they think about that story, what else do you think they might do? They might talk about that story. You know, your parents might read something in the newspaper or see something on the news and think about it. And then they'll start talking about it and asking someone, hey, did you know about so-and-so? Did you know that Duke won last night? Did you know he's going to be in the movie? Yeah. You start talking about things. And then if there's, there's one more thing, after you read about it and after you think about it and after you talk about it, is there anything else you might do? What? You might do something about it, right? If we find out about someone who needs some help, you know, I could read a story about someone who perhaps needs some, some food, and I could read about that, and I could think about that, and I could come here to the church and say, you know, somebody needs some food, but then I might do something about it. Yes, sir.
Okay, all right. When we get the newspaper, we read about it, we think about it, we talk about it, and then we do something about it. Yes, Caitlin. try and find the games in the comics. That's a good thing to use for the newspaper too. I'll usually look for the sports. There is another resource that we often read and then think and then talk and then hopefully do something. And that is the Bible. I don't have my Bible with me right here. It's up there. But when we read the Bible, we read about something, we think about it, then we talk about it in Sunday school and on other occasions. And then if we think it's really important, we do something about it. Today, we just heard a passage of scripture that's one of the most important stories where Jesus rose from the grave and the women came and they saw it and they thought about it. And then they weren't sure if they needed to talk about it or not. It said that they spoke briefly about it. Well, we know that they did talk about it, and we also need to talk about it. And today we come and tell the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, but now is risen and lives for each and every one of us and loves us very much. That's, the, that's better news than anything you'll find in the newspaper, and it's something we need to think about, talk about, and do something with. Let's pray together. Gracious God, Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived, who died, who rose again so that we might know life and have love. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you become come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you of first importance what I in turn had received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then, one of, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. For I'm the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Almighty, all-powerful, all-loving God, Today we celebrate. We celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate our salvation. We celebrate renewal and rebirth. We celebrate all our baptisms, both recent and in years hence. We celebrate the love of God and the grace of God. We have not received it in vain. May we live and so, may we spend these next few moments in silence, reflection, 
enjoy for that grace. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Let's join together as we sing our offertory hymn number 288, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, hymn number 288. Let's stand as we sing. Let us pray. Loving God, words cannot express the thanks that we feel for the sacrifice that you have made for us, for the glory of your resurrection, the wonder of this day that we celebrate. At this time in our worship service, we are reminded that Indeed, because of your sacrifice, we are able to give and to be a part of your kingdom's work. We pray this morning that as we offer of our gifts to you, we offer of your tithes and our offerings, that the gift and the giver would be blessed, that the gifts would be used to further your kingdom on this work, on this earth, and do the work of your church and spread the love and the good news of Christ our Savior. These things we pray in his name. Amen.
the anthem that the choir is going to share this morning is entitled Easter Song, and, and the, it's based on a hymn, which is number 314 in our hymnal. And I would ask you to turn to that hymn so that you can see the text and be reminded of the things that we're singing while we're singing and, and worship with us as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord through music and through text. Easter Song. God's children said, Amen. It was a cold and dreary night in Durham. Debbie was a sophomore at Duke. And while she was enjoying the college experience and having a whole new world open up to her, she was also a bit afraid. The old foundations of her childhood were beginning to seem a little unstable and unsure. And the prospect of becoming an adult, well, that didn't seem very inviting. At that point in her college experience, Debbie felt very afraid and alone and unsure. It was a cold and dreary night in Durham. 
And once again, the bookworm that she was, Debbie closed down the library, the last of the students to leave for the night. And she stood out at the bus stop, waiting for one of the buses, the last bus of the night, to come by and to pick her up and to take her to her dorm. And she stood there in that cold and darkness, thinking about her life and thinking about where she's been and where she was headed, and just not very sure. But then she looked down, and by the light of the street lamp, she could see that someone had painted some paw prints. It looked like the paw print of a large cat. She wondered, what could this be? I don't think we're playing Clemson this week. But she wondered, what is that? And since the bus wasn't in sight yet, she decided to take a few steps down this path of these cat tracks. She didn't have to go very far at all until she came to the point where the artist had finished the drawing with two words. Aslan lives. Aslan lives. And with that two-word statement, much of the confusion and the worry and the doubt vanished just like that. It had been a while since Debbie had thought of or remembered Aslan. But in just a moment, she remembered the wonderful stories that she read of Aslan in C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. Aslan, as you may recall, is the Christ figure in that story. He is a lion who wins by sacrificing himself, by giving his life. Aslan wins, someone had written. And she was reminded of her faith, a faith that has seen her through even the most puzzling and difficult of times. There's no question that many others had passed by that same place and kept right on walking and not even noticed the sign, but Debbie noticed it. Debbie noticed it, and that one proclamation was a great grace to her. It gave her enough grace to get through that night and perhaps many other days. We have a word for what Debbie experienced that night in Durham. The word is epiphany. Epiphany is a sudden realization of God. Debbie's experience isn't a textbook epiphany, but there are no such textbook epiphanies. They're all unique, all very personal. An epiphany is a sudden and striking realization of a profound truth, a realization that God is. Now, epiphanies come in every type of form and fashion, and they can happen at any time. You may get an epiphany, a sudden realization that God is while you're standing in the grocery store line. You might get an epiphany while you're having a conversation with an old friend or even with a perfect stranger. You might have an epiphany when you hear the perfect song at just the right time. I have even heard of people having epiphanies right here in the church. You just never know where you might have an epiphany. While you might even have an epiphany on your way to Damascus to gather up all the Christians who are there. That's how it happened for Saul. You remember Saul. Saul is a righteous but very angry man. He is sick and tired of hearing all the rumors about Jesus. Hearing all the different talk about Jesus living and then dying and then rising from the grave. These rumors are undermining Saul's authority as a Pharisee, as a keeper of the law. And it is his job to keep everybody in line. So Saul takes upon himself the task of burying the myth of Jesus once and for all. 
he gets permission from the chief priests to go to Damascus and to gather the disciples that are there and to arrest them. And he is on his way, and I imagine he is nearly there when out of nowhere, wow, epiphany, Aslan lives. A light knocks Saul to the ground, takes his voice, takes his sight, takes everything from the man, throws him right to the ground, and then redirects his life. It wasn't just a moment of Saul's life, it was the moment of Saul's life. It was the moment that Saul never forgot. In fact, it was after this moment that Saul becomes Paul. And Paul will speak of this moment that he had on the Damascus road for years to come. He never stopped talking about it. In fact, 20 years, 20 years after this moment, he writes to the Corinthians the passage that we have heard this morning reminding them of everything that they need to know. He spends the first 15 chapters of the book correcting some mistakes that are taking place and speaking some words of encouragement. But in the 15th chapter, he pauses for a moment to give them a word of first importance, reminding them that Jesus Christ came and he lived and he died and he rose again. And then he says that Jesus... And all of his glory appeared to many. We'll have to forgive Paul his chauvinism. And that in his list of people that Jesus appeared to, he forgot the very first group. Paul overlooks the fact that Jesus appeared to the women first. But he says that Jesus appeared to Cephas, to Peter. And then to some 500, some of whom are dead, but many, if not most, are still alive. And that the Lord also appeared to James and then to the apostles. That Jesus appeared to all of these who he was charging to keep on the way and the work of the kingdom of God. And then Paul says, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. So well put, wasn't it? As to one untimely born. Sorry if this is too personal, but it just seems to me as though Paul seems to be a bit proud of his humility here, doesn't he? As to one untimely born, he appears to me. Paul seems to be a little... uh, little proud of what has happened to him and any humility that he has he leaves by the wayside when he goes on to say and God's grace toward me has not been in vain in fact I have worked harder than all of the other apostles I have done more I have preached more often I have done more work I have worked harder than anyone else and God's grace toward me is not in vain I'm sorry Paul I'm not one to judge, but it just sounds a little too over the top, a little too arrogant, a little too, hey, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm the very least of the apostles, but look at me. I have worked so hard. It just seems that Paul is a little too proud, but at the same time, it's hard to argue with the man. It is so hard to argue with him For the truth is, the grace that God sent towards Paul was not in vain. Paul took the grace that was given to him. He picked himself up from that road and he put it to work. Grace, as we talk about in the church, is all about a free gift. It is God's unmerited gift to us. And that is true. But grace is something that we are to accept and to work and to nurture and to nourish so that we might share it with others. Paul says, his grace toward me is not in vain. And it wasn't because the man got up from there and he preached and he prayed. He went wherever he was called to go. He taught the scripture. 
He endured great sacrifice and he wrote. And he did so not out of any sense of obligation or any sense of desire to earn what he'd been given. But rather Paul did all of this working harder than anyone else because he understood that if the grave could not hold Jesus, then neither could the heart. If the grave could not hold this one, if death had no power over Jesus, then the human heart had no power either. You see, Paul understood that grace, God's glorious gift to us, grace cannot be contained. Grace cannot be held down. Grace cannot be put away. Grace cannot be boxed in. Grace cannot be shut up. Grace will not be pigeonholed. And you better believe grace will not be locked up. Paul understood that. And though you can't ask him about it, there is someone you can ask. When it comes to the fact that grace can't be locked up, I'd encourage you to go down to Atlanta and talk to the warden of the prison there. Talk to him because he knows all about the fact that grace can't be locked up. You see, the warden in the jail in Atlanta, he has a lady sitting on death row in his jail who doesn't belong there. She belongs in jail. There's no question about that. She'll tell you that. But there's also very little question that she belongs on death row. That lady's name is Kelly Gissendonner. Kelly was convicted in 1999 of plotting to kill her husband. She conspired with her boyfriend to kill her husband. She did not have any involvement in the act, but she plotted And her boyfriend killed her husband. The irony of justice here is that the boyfriend who killed Kelly's husband, he will likely be out of jail in about eight years. But Kelly remains on death row. Hers is a very interesting story, not only because of the justice issues, but also because of the fact that over the last several years, as she has sat on death row, Kelly has had a few epiphanies of her own. With the help and the nurture of many prison chaplains and some others who've been very devoted to her care and her, the redemption of her soul, she has confessed her sins. She has accepted a relationship with Jesus Christ and she has worked for restitution with her family. Now, I know the cynics out there would say, It doesn't matter. She deserves punishment. She deserves to pay with her life. After all, lots of folks get religion when they get put behind bars. And that's true. But there's also some good evidence. Really good evidence of Kelly's conversion. First of all, many of the guards speak about the fact that Kelly is such a calm and peaceful presence for the other inmates and even for them. That over these past few years, she has ministered to them and encouraged them. And then the most compelling proof to me is that Kelly doesn't just go to worship services there in the prison. She also signed up a few years ago to go to a theology class. A class to read and to study and to discuss not just the Bible, but what the Bible means and to unpack some theology. And over the years, she has formed a correspondence with one of the world's preeminent theologians of our day, a gentleman by the name of Jürgen Moltmann. She has written letters with Moltmann and and discussed things. And folks, I can tell you, I've been to theology class, and I've read Jürgen Moltmann. There is no way you can fake your way through theology and Jürgen Moltmann. That just doesn't happen. But Kelly says the most discouraging day of her incarceration came a few years ago when a new warden took over the prison. And one of the things that this new warden did was to restrict Kelly and some of the others from attending the theology class. They said, 
You are too much of a threat. You're on death row. You have no business being out amongst other people. You can't go to the class. Well, where there's a will, there's a way. And the way for Kelly to continue in her theology studies was for the professors to come to her. But there was one stipulation. Kelly had to remain behind a gate while the professor taught and a few other students were there. She had to stay behind the gate while everyone else enjoyed the fellowship. Kelly reflects on that gate And she says, that gate was meant to keep everyone and everything separated from me. But that gate couldn't keep out the knowledge that I was hungry for. That gate could not keep out the friendship that I needed. That gate could not keep out the community that I craved for. And that gate, it sure could not keep God out. Well, amen, Kelly. Amen and amen. That gate could not keep God out. There isn't a gate that can keep God out. There isn't a gate that can keep God in. Isn't that the truth of this day? Isn't that what we have all gathered here to celebrate? That there is no gate, there is no stone that can keep God in or can keep God out. Nothing can keep God in place. Nothing can keep God from us, and nothing can keep God from gracing us. That is what Paul will tell, not the Corinthians, but he will say to the Romans in that beautiful passage when he will say, friends, let's realize that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor things present, Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. That, my friends, is today's headline. No need reading the paper. That is the headline of this day. It's that God's grace toward me and God's grace toward you is greater than anything else. And no matter what life asks of us, no matter what life does to us, God's grace is greater than anything else. Now, I heard one amen back in the back somewhere, and that's great, but I wonder how many of us truly believe this. Do we really believe that God's grace toward me and to you is greater than anything else? I have a preacher friend who is trying to believe this. It may sound surprising that a preacher is trying, but preachers are human beings too. He's trying to understand this. My friend is serving in a terrific place. God has blessed him in ways that are beyond imagination. He is serving a great church. He lives in a wonderful community. He has the good fortune of knowing he is exactly in the right place at the right time doing God's work. It is all such a a wonderful experience for my friend, but at the same time, Ministry is very hard work. And there are days that my friend just gets overwhelmed by the load, by the pressure, by all the people needing just a a little bit of his time or attention. My friend tells me that he got out of town just for an evening not too long ago. And enjoyed a nice meal out with his family and just a little bit of pause and reprieve. Not to think about anything and so on. And and such a nice time with his family. But at the end of the evening, he had to drive home. And just as he got within sight of his town, it, it all came back to him. Everything that he needed to do, all the people he needed to see and visit, and all the different pressures that he was feeling. And in just a moment of clarity and confession, he looked over to his wife and said, You know, with everything that I have going on, with everything that the church wants me to be and needs me to be, I'm just not sure I will ever be the Christian 
or the minister I'd hoped to be. His wife very graciously allowed him to talk. And he said, it's just I'm not so sure that I have the time and the energy to nurture what God has put in me and to pursue what really makes me come to life when I think of God and the church. He just needed to say those things to see if he really believed them or not, and his wife gave him that sacred space to say that. Before long, they got home. And the next morning, my pastor friend went into the office, opened up his Bible and his devotional. And the devotion for the day was to read the story of Peter denying Jesus. That's a hard story to read because it's so hard for us to not put ourselves in the story and ask, us, ask ourselves what we would do. And as my friend read the story and thinking about Peter and his denials and the shame and resisting the grace that God had extended toward him, the spirit just seemed to to come into the room and sat right there beside my preacher friend. And the spirit looked at my preacher friend and said, David, if you continue to try and be all things to all people, if you continue to try and can keep doing things the way they've always been done, if you continue to try and do things the same old way, if you continue to try and do things in a way so everybody will like you and to keep up, if you're going to resign yourself to being what everyone wants you to be, then David... You're no better than Peter. You're no different from him at all. Because if you deny your best self, you're not just cheating yourself, but you are denying the grace that I have put toward you. If you continue to deny your best self, you don't just deny who you are, you deny my grace and you deny me. And David, please, don't roll a stone in front of your heart. For have you not heard or have you just forgotten? Aslan lives. Thanks be to God. Will you pray? Gracious God, your son Jesus Christ lives. The grave could not hold him. And we are fooling ourselves if we think our hearts can. Lord, help us to receive the grace that you have put toward us in Jesus Christ in your spirit. And help us to share that grace with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with our families, with this community that so desperately needs the love and the truth of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for gracing us in Jesus Christ. And thank you for giving us the privilege of gracing others through your spirit in this world that we live in. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. God has extended grace to you in Jesus Christ, winning victory over death and sorrow by the empty tomb. If you would accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, accept the grace that he puts towards you, I invite you to come and to make your decision known with your family of faith. Our hymn of response is number 294, Christ Arose. Let us stand and sing joyfully.